Hello, my name is Robert Pariso. I'm with the June C. Garrison, and also joining us is John Saunders. Um, Hello. And today we have the esteemed honor of talking to Mr. Paul Blake, who, as many of you know, is most famously known for playing Greedo in the Star Wars trilogy. This is part of the 501st Legion's um, event of 1138, where we're celebrating 50 years of Lucasfilm. <laughs> Um, and we're also supporting FIRST. And FIRST is a uh, organization that inspires young people to be science and technology innovators. So please click the link, support, and we would greatly appreciate it. So how are we you doing? We certainly will. We certainly will, Robert. Um, in fact, any of you watching right now, uh, please just donate on the link to First Robotics, as much money as you've got, and more, in fact, probably go down to the bank now, I think would be quite a good idea. Maybe one, two, three thousand bucks, something like that would be very good because it's an extremely good cause. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, Paul. So, um, so what brought you to acting? What led you down that Ooh. path, Paul? Oh, the easy ones first, eh, Robert? Exactly, let's see. Um, a, a desperation, really, like most actors. Uh, I, I suppose I, I went to college to do English and drama, and my, my parents ran a little um, uh, sort of theatre in uh, in the UK in the Midlands. Uh, so I suppose I grew up with a, a little bit of theatre, so I was kind of used to that. Um, but I was pretty hopeless during school. Uh, like a lot of actors, and uh, and when it came to finding something to do, I just uh, I I I think I went down to London, stumbled into a few uh, auditions because a friend of mine was living down there and was also trying to become an actor, and um, I joined a a small theatre company called the Bubble Theatre Company in London in the late sixties, early seventies, uh, on the basis that I could play the guitar and some spoons, uh, both. Uh, I could play the guitar, but I couldn't play the spoons. And of course, the first thing they asked me to do was to play the spoons. So um, it, it didn't go well, my first uh, <laughs> my first episode um, in the theatre. But uh, I kind of hung on in there. And like a lot of actors um, joining the profession in the, in the 60s, 70s and the 80s, it was such a fertile time for the arts, uh, particularly in London and New York and... Uh, Australia too. I mean, one of my best mates uh, came over from Australia to, wow. to train in London. And um, so that's kind of how I, I got into it. And then it went from there. I went to do a lot of repertory theatre all up and down the country and then a little bit of TV and the odd movie if I was really lucky. And, uh, and I stumbled into something called uh, Blue Harvest, which uh, I don't know what happened to it, but it was quite a, they said it was going to come out, but I'm not sure whether it ever did. But um, <laughs> that was a long while ago. But yeah, I've got a few reminiscences of that. Nice. <laughs> 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 Paul, uh, John Saunders here from Nightfall Garrison in Melbourne, Australia. Um, you're, an, you're an accomplished Shakespearean actor, uh, stage <laughs> actor. Um, you've done some TV work. Uh, obviously, you've played the most notorious bounty hunter in the galaxy on the big screen. Um, an apology to uh, Jeremy Bullock there. Um, <laughs> what do you enjoy more, um, stage, TV or film, and, and why? Uh, I, most actors will, will tell you theatre because I suppose it's 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 most immediate and uh, and there's no going back if you get it wrong but uh, I loved I love movies basically because I didn't do many of them <laughs> and every one that I did I really enjoyed doing because you get a, a little trailer if you're really lucky and uh, or a, a very nice dressing room so uh, and I like the idea of sitting around all day drinking copious amounts of coffee and then having to do 100 miles an hour for a tiny little scene that may or may not be shown. In fact, most of the time it isn't shown. Of course, it ends up on the cutting room floor. But you're very kind to say that, um, I mean, I was lucky enough to do a few um, Shakespearean pieces and, and I did um, play uh, Macbeth at one point, I think. And God knows how I remembered any of those lines. I certainly couldn't remember anything now. I can't remember who I am most of the time. So uh, remembering Shakespeare would be um, would be very difficult. But I know a lot of my friends still are. I mean, there are still quite a few um, actors out there who are still doing it, sort of 70 and 80 plus. Wow, that's amazing. 
So kind of having, you know, all that background doing, you know, stage and everything like that. What was it like when you walked on to the Star Wars set? Well, this was 1976, okay, mm -hmm. and it was Elstree Studios just outside London. Very kind of small, but very famous studios. They'd done a lot of comedy there before. And of course, none of us in the, in the very first movie ever knew anything about what we were letting ourselves in for um, on Star Wars. I was very lucky. I, I, um, I got sent the script or my little section of the script um, and sort of read it and didn't make hide nor hair of what what any of it meant or said right. apart from the little scenes that I was involved in which seemed to me to be cowboy scenes and I love sort of um, cowboy and Indian movies so I thought oh yeah this is um, I, I this is the saloon bar and uh, the uh, the good bad guy comes into town and we have a shootout so I kind of understood that but about so I suppose about three weeks later after getting that script which I've still got um, I, I wandered over to Elstree Studios very early in the morning, very uh, sort of hungover after a, a couple of bad nights previously, and uh, walked out onto the set of, I think it was Soundstage 5 or something, but it had nothing on it apart from a mock-up of the Millennium Falcon, um, which was built out of flats and painted beautifully, painted, I mean it was extraordinarily good, but all it was was two flats with um, a, a ramp going up the middle, and you walked up the ramp and fell off the back. That's, that's as much as the Millennium Falcon was in 1976. Nobody around, apart from some guys standing in the corner of the, of the room, um, sort of looking at the set. So I walked over to him and said, um, uh, oh, I'm, my name's Paul, Paul Blake. Um, uh, I'm here to see, oh, you couldn't get me a coffee, could you? I'm desperate uh, for something to drink. I've just come off the train. It's really early. I didn't have time to get any, but, and he went off and, and bought me a, a coffee and I was drinking coffee and still chatting to him. I said, do you know anything about this, um, this, this sci-fi thing being recorded here? I said, I'm here to see somebody called George, somebody or other. And he said, I I'm, I I'm George Lucas. Uh, and I said, oh, you're the, uh, <laughs> You're the director, and he, yes, he was. <laughs> so that's how I found myself wandering out onto that very um, um, now. I mean, it's a, it's called the George Lucas Soundstage now. So it's a, an incredibly famous building now, and and it hosts a whole pile of uh, famous TV shows over here in in England. Uh, but that first morning walking out onto that was. Um, was pretty something because like everybody else at the time we thought it was going to be some terrible b-movie sure. uh, we thought we were going to be an attack of the killer tomatoes so we weren't <laughs> holding out much hope for uh, the then blue harvest the now star wars uh, right. but i think that swiftly changed once i walked out onto the set of the cantina which was altogether different that was pretty cool Paul, well, you mentioned that uh, it felt like a bit of a Western, a good guy versus bad guy. Um, yeah. Obviously, that sort of drew you into the role a little bit there. I guess, what did you think when you saw that funky 70s disco space suit that you had to wear? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was lucky to get any costume whatsoever. I mean, Jeremy had to virtually fit into his Boba Fett costume. That's how he got the job. If he fitted the costume, uh, he got the job. Fortunately, he did. I had no costume at the point I did the um, uh, the interview, but then about a week later, I, I uh, was called over to do a, what was called a life cast of your of your head uh, from neck upwards, and I thought, oh, this this could be interesting. So in those days, you sat in a chair and they stuck plaster of Paris all over your face, a couple of straws up your nose while it uh, while it um, set, and if you were lucky, a little plastic uh, kind of solution on your face uh, to prevent it sticking to your face. And so it's pretty claustrophobic. And I thought, this is exciting. So had that done for about an hour, and uh, then they did the back as well and stuck the two bits together. And off I go, didn't hear anything more until about three weeks later when I, I eventually got the final script and a, and a re rehearsal schedule uh, to which I duly turned up to. And in my dressing room, there was this um, <laughs> piece of rubber <laughs> hanging off a, a coat hanger, which I sort of turned around and it, I, it looked like um, a bird's eye pea, basically. But it was Greedo's head and with the spikes, and as as you see him in the um, in the movie. 
Uh, and, and so I thought, oh, right, that's me, is it? Okay. Um, and the costume, uh, again, I think um, Stuart Freeborn had come up with a, a thing that I, not sure whether this is entirely true, but I heard that he'd had to do so many aliens by that point uh, when it came to doing Greedo that he really didn't know what to do. But the night before he had a deadline for Greedo, um, uh, he saw an advert um, for bird's eye peas and the peas were bouncing in the advert. And that's where he got the idea for Greedo's head, <laughs> a green bouncing pea with spikes. So uh, that's, uh, that's how I think Greedo came about. But the costume, was I was kind of relieved about really because it, it was uh, it was very lightweight, um, so lightweight pair of trousers, um, some very light shoes, uh, and it was made out of a kind of parachute silk. So again, very lightweight. So I I got off pretty pretty easily compared to people like Pete Mayhew and um, and Anthony Daniels and uh, and everyone else who had to be sort of sewn into their costumes or bolted into their costumes. Do you mind me asking about the shoes there? And uh, obviously they were never, they were never seen on, on screen. What, what kind of shoes were you actually wearing? Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. to this day, um, I'm with Dame Edith Evans who said, well, if I get the shoes right, I've got the character. So I felt the same about Greedo and they were kind of loafers. <laughs> they were white loafers, really. I don't know where the props department had got them from, uh, but they were um, a, a very flat, um, beigey, whitish uh, loafer that was was pretty okay to wear. Again, it wasn't like a pair of Wellingtons or anything that you had to cut down on. Um, so that's a first. I've never talked in the 40 years since I put those loafers on. God knows where they are now. Maybe George has got them at Skywalker Ranch. Uh, who knows? But yes, they were they were um, they were kind of cool. So I have fond memories of the loafers because they. Uh, they stood around on set for a long time. The hands were entirely different. The gloves. <laughs> they were... Um, <laughs> they were originally gardening gloves. And wow. they were so sticky and heavy that uh, once you put them on, you virtually couldn't hold much with them. And I think after George had looked at them, he thought, well, it's not really alien enough. Uh, and so he had the props department, or they came up with the idea of sewing these long tubular um, fingers with little blobby ends onto the ends of the gardening gloves. And of course, when you put those on, the, they just went blur, blur everywhere. So however Greedo managed to get a shot off, I do not know since uh, he couldn't pull the trigger with those fingers. <laughs> <laughs> wow that's that's amazing well i mean it sounds like it was definitely quite the experience where were you able to stay around on set like past your specific filming scenes and just kind of watch things or i mean what's some of the other memories you have as far as surrounding that time yes that's that's where i think um being involved in the cantina which was the only real set on the very first movie. It was the only set that was physically built rather than just little mock-ups mock uh, with a blue screen behind where you, uh, for instance, we all played on those. We all played on the gun turrets uh, from the Millennium Falcon, which was a little mock-up, which just had a gun and a blue screen behind it and a sort of plastic. Well, you've seen it on the front of the Millennium Falcon yeah. and the little gun turrets where this is. So we all played on those. Those, those were real, really fun. But the, the cantina scene, the shooting of that, was incredibly interesting. So yes, you're absolutely right, Robert. Um, quite a few of us uh, came down to watch that. And I sat in the booths at the back of the camera in the cantina, watching for quite some time, all those little bits with Alec, Alec Guinness, who um, came in with, uh, with um, Harrison, I think, and um, Kenny Baker and, uh, and Anthony down a, down a ramp to, to enter into the cantina as, as, as such. Uh, and that took quite a long time to shoot because when Kenny was coming down, he kept on falling off the side. <laughs> the, the, the little thing kept on falling off the side. So all you heard was, oh, bloody hell, what's going on inside, inside R2-D2 <laughs> as he hit the floor? Uh, so that was pretty cool, watching, watching all that going ahead. And also the little sequence with the, um, the bartender. And again, Alec, who uses his... Um, lightsaber to slice off the uh, the guy's arm that was so cool uh, to watch all that so yeah and you're right again generally 
no one would be interested in watching other people's takes. You'd be far too happy to sit in your own dressing room reading the afternoon yeah. paper. And because it was such a long day, and particularly if you've only got a small bit to do, then you were kept mostly waiting around all day until the very last thing in the afternoon. And then everything was 100 miles, miles an hour. In fact, one of the interesting things about uh, getting involved in with you guys and the 501 and all that stuff um, was learning from other actors what had gone on in their bits um, over the years. So I know a lot more about Star Wars from what happened to the other guys than I do from what happened in my little bits. Wow. That's amazing. Paul, you, you must be aware that Greedo has become a bit of a, a cult figure um, for a range of reasons. Um, so <laughs> much so much so that you know, ten-year-old kids who weren't born in the seventies um, that they call out his name whenever they see him at a troupe. So he's you know readily identifiable for a creature that didn't get a, a great deal of screen time. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I have no idea how long he was on screen for, but a very short period of time. Uh, was, and, uh, yeah, I've incredibly inc like all of us from the original trilogy. I think it's fair to say that most of the characters, the, the smaller part players who weren't um, doing um, the lead bits, obviously, uh, have now all become iconic. I mean, uh, Boba Fett, Tim, Tim Rose playing Admiral um, Akbar, uh, all the, certainly all the the admirals, all my old mates from Michael Shear to uh, all, all the other guys who played the smaller bits and pieces, um, I think their figures and their um, uh, personality was so um, so strong in those first three movies that the, the kids really do uh, latch onto them. I think, I, I don't know why Greedo became such a, a hit because he was the most inept assassin in assassination history. And um, uh, I think, <laughs> It was very unfortunate and very sad because Mrs. Greedo is still at home waiting with 220 other little Greedo children uh, for him to come back home. So it's a very sad story for Greedo. But I'm eternally grateful that the kids uh, do know him and love him. I I'm going to love him over the years. He's uh, inept but lovable, I think, is his, um, is his story. <laughs> So, so how did you how did you cope with that? Because I remember seeing a quote online um, where you said that you know you've done Macbeth and everything like that, and you've done as you'd mentioned before, you've done all these you know great kind of cornerstones of literature and performance and everything, and you're being known for Greedo. How how did you wrap your head around that the first time that you really started having people kind of going, well, hey, you're the guy to play Greedo, aren't you? you know? <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, I uh, very happily say that um, on my tombstone, it will say, Paul Blake, here lies Greedo. He shot first. <laughs> but on the back, it will say, on the back, it will say, or did he? <laughs> <laughs> so, and I mean, for years, um, I think I was... Um, arrogantly saying, yeah, but for God's sake, I've played Stanislavski, I've done Shakespeare, I've done thousands of plays in the UK, I've been all over the world, I've toured, etc, etc, etc. But when you realise what a huge impact that um, uh, trilogy had to begin with, uh, I started to realise how lucky I was to to have ever become involved in in, in it at all. And now I'm eternally grateful that the the best thing possibly I'll be remembered for is being Greedo, because it's a it's a tremendous honour to have been involved in all those early moves. Everybody else will tell you the same thing, who were involved in those early films, as much as they hated it at the time, and we did hate it. Couldn't wait to get home most of the time. But um, I think all of all of the guys will tell you what a what a privilege it was to have been involved in that. And nobody knew that it was going to be a success at all. Apart from George, George knew he, mm. he had every faith in it. I mean, he had to, but yeah. apart from that, he he was um, he was steadfast, and and thank God he was because um, it became hugely hugely successful, as you know, and, and one of the great um, one of the great movies now. So it's a, a great privilege, and the one thing that supports that is that. Obviously, over the years, we've all had to sign a lot of autographs and strange things, body parts, etc. And so I won't go into that in too much detail. However, 
Um, I did find myself with Richard Le Parmentier once in, in the States somewhere. Oh, yeah. um, and um, he was Admiral Motti, Richard, d delightful guy, very rude, incredibly funny. Uh, and we were old friends and uh, we were doing a, a, a tour in the States somewhere. And um, we got uh, asked to go to a, a, a place, uh, a bar, uh, and restaurant, um, which was very famous because it had been mentioned by um, Klinger in MASH as his favourite, um, oh, his yeah. favourite bar. And uh, yeah, I, I can't remember it to, to this day, but anyway, we went and they were charming to us and, and they had these little ceramic um, hot dogs, <laughs> which they asked us to sign. So we duly <laughs> signed these ceramic hot dogs and there they appeared in a little cabinet on the wall. And Richard's and my hot dog were in a cabinet <laughs> next to Humphrey Bogart's hot dog. Oh, wow. So that's pretty cool, I think, to have, <laughs> to have ended up in Klinger's Bar in, uh, wow. in, in a place in the States. So that's how um, iconic uh, Star Wars became and, and for our little bits and pieces in it, how lucky we were to have been, to have been involved in all that. Yeah. Wow. So now, I have no problems with my tombstone saying here lies Greedo. That's perfectly okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some of the other projects that you've been involved in? I mean, you know, I, I kind of obviously look a little bit at your IMDB and things like that, but it's kind of what, what other things have kind of stood out to you over time? Oh God. Right. Well, it does have to be the theatre because I did so few movies. I mean, I did a few when, when I first started as a young actor, but I think as the way it went, I just found myself, I, I mean, I toured all over the world uh, doing lots of plays um, with a company from London. Uh, and those times, I think, gave me the sort of the wanderlust to work in other countries. And that I really enjoyed. I worked in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in the Bahamas, in Hawaii. Uh, and doing that, I think it gave me that uh, that desire to, to, to carry on uh, traveling, which is why I love to do conventions now. But yeah, I mean, I did a lot of stuff. I did some West End things, which were pretty cool. I was in the Brothers Karamazov, which was in town. I did a, a show for a, a famous company in the West End called Vanity, which was um, which was great fun. Uh, so I really did find myself involved in a lot of theatre and when you're doing that and in those days when I was younger I suppose movies uh, came up uh, very seldom uh, for, for the young actors in those days and I was asked round about after we finished doing uh, Star Wars I think which was about 1978 or round about the beginning of the 80s I was asked to go to the States uh, to do some stuff but I turned it down because I was still involved in getting in doing uh, uh, lots of stuff in, in in London and really enjoying it so I suppose uh, looking back on it had I <coughs> had I traveled to the States maybe I could have had a, a better film career but um, having stayed in, in uh, the UK, uh, I'd, I never stopped working, which in those days for an actor was the goal. As long as you worked, um, you, were, you were doing pretty well. And, and fortunately, uh, I never had to do anything else. So I always made a living from acting, which was pretty cool, considering it involved 40 years worth of, um, of work. So that was, was very lucky. Yeah, now it's different you know. now sold that. Yeah. <laughs> sure. yeah give me fame any day <laughs> <laughs> sure. yeah. yes <laughs> great well, and i think john you're actually you do the greedo costume in the, for the detachment in the movie, right? yeah i've got a, a greedo costume um have worn it you know many times and uh, i know the pain of of the the hands and the mask that you were talking about uh paul and um, you know, the, the breathing issues and the lens foggings. Did you, did you have those as well on set? Oh, yeah. They, well, fortunately on set, I could take the head off whenever, because mm. it was only later that when, I mean, I thought um, that original scene, the very famous scene, I thought that was going to be cut immediately. So all my bits, I thought, were going to be the bits that eventually did it. I think they did end up in the special edition. Uh, because it's a bit where Jabber is walking and Jabber is the actor oh, okay. in Holland. Right. So I thought that was going to be all my bits. I didn't pay any attention at all to the <laughs> to the now really famous scene. 
Um, but we had little, uh, the eyes were little kind of ping pong balls uh, that had been painted blue, so you couldn't see anything out of them, anything you could see out of. And in those days, um, they didn't have the sophistication uh, that a lot of masks have today, where they have breathing apparatus inside and they are digitally operated and you can have fans inside if it's big enough. So we had none of that. But as I say, what was lucky was the fact that I could actually take it off and stick it down whenever we weren't filming. But yeah, absolutely, as soon as you put it on. The worst thing about the mask is people always, I'm sure they ask you the same thing, John. Um, they said, aren't you really sweating in that costume? And what about the mask? It must be John. I said, no, the, the sweat is not a problem uh, at all. It didn't really have a, uh, any kind of problem. What was the problem was the stink, because as you took it off and left it for half an hour and then had to put it back on again. You did not want to put it back on again because the latex, had, even in, in that short time, had, had degraded slightly. So I, I, have, I feel your pain, John. The pain of my wall too well. Once it comes off, it stays off. There's no putting it back on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Who made your trousers, John? Did you, did you get somebody to make them for you? Um, I did, yes. Uh, all all tailor-made um, yeah. to oh, measurement. Oh, God. Uh, yeah. Luxury. Luxury. We don't do halves. It's, it's all, all screen accurate, so as best as we can get it to, to what you wear. Yeah. Well, it's like the Stormtroopers. I mean, your costume, uh, the 501 Stormtroopers costumes were much better than anything in the movie. I mean, <laughs> everything in the, in the first movie had to be taped on after about 10 minutes because it was always dropping off all the little boxes and the, and yeah. the helmets were always coming apart. And uh, so yeah, you have much better stuff than, uh, than anything we had in the films. Although, you know, I'm doing the costume department down, they did a fantastic job, but there was so much of it. And um, particularly in the cantina, there was so so many creatures and aliens, um, most of which you don't see in the movie, um, which must have taken them weeks to make and uh, and uh, were never seen. But then, twas ever thus in film. Wow. You said trousers. W w were you wearing a two-piece suit, or was it all all one big jumpsuit? Uh, two-piece. Yeah, there was a trouser. I can't remember what. Um, I remember the jerkin and the and the the sort of the jacket that was quite cool that was sort of rubberized slightly as, as i say in bits of parachute in it so very light but i can't remember whether i i wore a t-shirt or not I, I i sometimes see old black and white pictures of me with the uh, props department and i think oh maybe oh right yes i did wear that at the time but it was so long ago that um uh, difficult to remember and that's what's kind of interesting that's why we talk to each other those of us who are still still hanging around uh, from the early movies, uh, because it's difficult now uh, to think back to all those years ago, whether we're just imagining that's what happened or whether it actually did happen. And other people go, oh, yeah, yeah. I remember when Peter Diamond was like, Peter Diamond was one of the um, stunt guys or the head right. stunt guy first. Uh, to, well, all three of the um, uh, trilogy. Uh, sadly, he died some years ago now. But I remember Peter telling me quite a bit of, about all the stuff that I hadn't seen. Um, um, before uh, they filmed that, um, the, the, the canteen a bit where Greedo gets shot. I mean, that was interesting too. I mean, because I had no idea how they were going to do it. Right. Neither had they. Um, and uh, so they came up with the idea that originally they'd have a dummy. Uh, they do the scene up to the point where Greedo gets shot and then they stick mm. the dummy in his seat and blow the dummy up and then they put the costume back on me, which is exactly how we shot the scene. Um, but the costume was on fire when I was putting it back. <laughs> so putting it back on, it had a great big hole in the back and still smoking. And in fact, the props departments did pour little bits of acid all over it to make it steam even more. So I was pretty keen to die in that scene very quickly. Wow, yeah. Um, so at least you don't have to go through that, John. <laughs> Maybe I'll suggest that for your next event. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say, you know, there's going to be a lot of 501st people besides obviously all the people that will be watching this that might be getting ideas now. And all of a sudden that might become a discussion topic of, oh, we've got to put acid on it. So, John, guess what? You've got to start smoking. You know, so, um, <laughs> that's very accurate. Not that's very accurate. <laughs> no, I'm not going to go that far. Yes, yeah. absolutely. No, no. Quite so right. when did you start doing the convention circuit, Paul? And how, well, did that was, get, how did you get drawn into that? That again was through um, that was through Jeremy Bullock. I I've known Jeremy for years and years and years, 
and uh, we'd done a play together. We, we were touring um, a play in, I think we were in, in the Far East somewhere. And uh, one night we were both backstage and he said, you were, um, you were in Star Wars, weren't you, Paul? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, you, you were too, weren't you, Jim? And he said, yeah, yeah, I did a bit. He said, why don't you do conventions? And I said, what's a convention? So, <laughs> so that's how I, Jeremy got me involved uh, to begin with a long, long while ago. And I, I got invited to do something up in, in North London um, uh, by some promoters over here. And that's how it all started. Thank heavens. Thank you, Hasbro. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I can imagine it must have been quite the surprise whenever you uh, walked out to your table and saw all those people with Rito figures and everything. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. I mean, and don't forget, really, prior to Star Wars, autographs used to be signed by people at stage doors. Mm. Or if you were very lucky, if you were a big movie star, mostly, um, then your publicity agents would sign things on their behalf. And that was the end of it. So to actually come across somebody giving you some cash for it and queuing up as far as the eye could see, it was an extraordinary thing and bringing all kinds of little, little bits and pieces. Um, so yes, that was, uh, that, was, that was truly amazing. I mean, uh, particularly when they started arriving with the figures and you had no idea who the figures were or who made them originally. And over the years, I've, I've collected one or two of those myself. I really like the figures. They're really cool now. In the early days, not so cool, but much sought after now, of course. Right, right. No, that's, yeah, that's amazing. So were you able to kind of reconnect via the convention circuit with a lot of the, the actors, like you mentioned, Jeremy and Richard Lepagamante and everything? Yeah. So kind of a, a way to see some fellow colleagues that you haven't seen in years, that sort of thing? Or yeah, did you exactly some? that, Robert. Um, and that's what's so cool about it, is that uh, it, it's a big party for us. It's such a, uh, a privilege to, uh, to go and, and, and meet the guys and, um, and see who's still alive. In fact, we've got a sweepstake on who's dying next, which is great. So um, I'm, just, uh, I'm just not putting too much on me at the moment. Good. <laughs> no, it was, yeah, you're right. It was a fabulous exclusive club uh, that everybody um, enjoyed being part of and, and still does. I mean, one of the great things was to go uh, somewhere and meet up with the guys and go for a beer or a meal and, um, and chat about, uh, uh, well, about anything and everything, really, because they're all pretty cool, all of the guys from the original films. And, and we're, you're absolutely right. We've all become quite... Uh, quite close friends well, although don't tell them that they'll ask they'll ask me for money so you know, <laughs> yeah. just keep that under your hat yeah yeah <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll leave that part out and everything yeah have you ever been to um seattle and the reason i asked that is is there's a, a pop culture museum there <laughs> um and when i was there within the last i would say a couple of years they actually have a set of the greedo hands in a had on display that were supposed to be production lineage. So I was wondering if you've ever been able to go there. I've been to, yes, I've been to Seattle. I don't think I, that's not the Smithsonian. No. Uh, no, it's the Seattle Museum specifically, is it? No, yeah, I, it's, I, the, it's the museum. I believe it's called the Museum of Pop Culture, but it's down by the Space Needle. Yeah. It, it oh, I a, must. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'll, next time I'm in Seattle, I'll, I'll catch that. But I, I haven't been. I've, I've seen the Smithsonian, and that was. That was pretty uh, impressive. They've got so much stuff, and um, that tours all over the world constantly. So, so that's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, no, I must go to the to the one in Seattle. I do like Seattle; it's a great city. Yeah, absolutely. So, what else, John? What else have we not covered with Mr. Blake? While we we've have? covered most things, have we not? <laughs> I believe so. I brought the picture. So. <laughs> Okay, well, I think um, I think we can kind of wrap things up. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with John and I today. It's truly, truly an honor for both of us. And um, like we had mentioned before, you know, we're all here on behalf of the 501st Legion. You know, the event 1138, celebrating 50 years of Lucasfilm. We're also supporting, you know, the first organization. So please, and that's all related to, you know, science, technology, education please click on the links, donate, 
as Paul said, go to the bank, withdraw a couple of thousand bucks if you have to, but that would be great. <laughs> Well, likewise, thank you, Robert and John. It's been brilliant speaking to you. And um, uh, yeah, anybody who's who's watching this, please do donate. It is for a fantastic uh, cause. And the 501s are constantly doing uh, wonderful things for charity. So support them whenever you can. Great, thank you so much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Bye-bye, guys. Take care.